Hello, I'm Alistair McLeod, and tonight's Australian story is about my friend and fellow chef, Matt Galinsky. Matt's unique cooking style is greatly respected across the gastronomic world. But when a fire tore through his home on Boxing Day in 2011, his life was destroyed. Tonight, for the first time on television, Matt describes how he overcame the unthinkable and found a new passion for life. This is his story. Well, we're not going to lift today to that heavy point. Yeah. Before the accident, before I got burned, I loved running. And then when I woke up in hospital and I'd lost 25 kilos and I couldn't walk, I knew that the only way that I could get out of that hospital quickly was to really push myself as hard as I could physically. In six months, he did his first five kilometre run. In eight months, he did his first 10 kilometre run. My dad would just get angry and angry. You could see him worrying about me. Um, but I explained to him, Dad, you know, this is something I need to do. I need to set goals and I need to keep busy. It's for my mental health. <laughs> One of the things that people say to you is, you know, how do you get over something like the fire? But you never actually get over it. Nobody gets over it. But you've got to get around it. So it's always there, but you've gone past it. I guess for the first couple of years, obviously you're going to be Matt Galinsky, the celebrity chef, the guy that got really bad burns and lost his family. And it's a real battle not to be defined by that. You can yell and scream all you like and it's not going to bring them back. So it's, there's like that period of anger and depression and, and um, resentment and then there's just... A, the, only, the only sensible thing to do is acceptance. It's the, only, the only thing you can do is just accept that that's, sometimes that's how life goes and there's absolutely nothing you can do to change it. This is the final party for the Noosa Food and Wine Festival for 2018. So feeding 500 people out on the beach right now. Right now. Everyone's different in the way they deal with trauma. I still really don't understand how I got through mine. You know, for me, if I hadn't have been able to cook, I don't think I don't think I could have dealt with things. The day that I got out of hospital, and I picked up a knife and I cooked dinner because I needed to know that I could actually do it. And, and I did it, you know, and then, I, and then I sort of knew that that was going to be OK. He's so lucky that he can still use his hands from his accident. He's even said if his accident had affected his hands, he would have learnt to use his feet to cook. <laughs> Some cooks, you know, talk about sitting on their nonna's knee and making gnocchi or whatever. I didn't have any of that. <laughs> when I was about six years old, my folks bought a farm on the Sunshine Coast and that's where I grew up. I was surrounded by amazing pawpaws, mangoes, avocados, bananas, and the best of them. They must be a different variety. I think that's where my influence from food came from. Have you taken much honey out of it lately? Well, by the time I hit high school, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a chef. He chose to do home economics, which at that time, you know, was probably a strange thing for a boy. As soon as I finished school, I ignored the suggestions that maybe I should get an apprenticeship at the Big Pineapple uh, and moved, got the hells out of the Sunshine Coast, moved to Brisbane and got an apprenticeship down there. went a bit feral at that time and much to my dismay when he formed a band with some of his mates and called it First Offenders I, I had to <laughs> worry a little bit then. <laughs> 
I met my wife, Rachel, when I was 21 or so. I was just finished with my apprenticeship and she was finishing her nursing degree. We met through mutual friends at a party and we were inseparable pretty much from then on. Rachel, Rachel was lovely, she was vibrant, she was cheeky. Um, but she could get away with it. <laughs> Matt and Rachel had a natural passion and, and shared values and, yeah, they just worked really well together and there was that unconditional love with each other. And then they went overseas. They were in Birmingham and they said, got some news, you're going to be a granddad, you know. We're having a, we're having a baby, I think. And then I got another card a little while later and they said, you better make that two babies. <laughs> Sage and Willow were born in 99 and Stalia came along two years later. The twins, they were diagnosed with a condition called de vivo disease. It's a similar condition to cerebral palsy. They went to mainstream school and Rachel was very passionate about that. She was determined to not have them locked away somewhere. The way they progressed was just incredible. They were catching up in leaps and bounds. Starley took on that big sister role almost. By the time she was eight or nine, she would be the one that was looking after them, making sure they were OK at school. Lovely child. And Matt and Rachel had every reason to be very proud of her. The first time I met him was at the restaurant where he really shone for many years, Ricky Ricardo's, in Noosa. We became friends through our shared interests. And then we both had the opportunity to do this wonderful thing called Ready Steady Cook together. OK, up next, Miss Janelle Bloom and Mr Matt Galinsky. Ready, Steady, Cook, I think, is a precursor to the existing shows that are on television. Award-winning news chef, Mr Matt Golinski. Matty, how are you? Got your jeans on? The chefs that they gathered for those shows have, you know, been really successful within the industry and with what they've done. Is gas better than electricity or... Gas is easier gas to control, or... it's faster, it's instant heat. You don't have to wait for it to heat up. <laughs> Ready, Steady, Cook, start cooking in for all the, the, the light-heartedness of it, oh, you didn't want to come second. And uh, that Matt fellow, he didn't want to come second, but he did the odd time. Oh, oh, so we move all this away, I'll move that. Oh, it's like cowbell. Oh, he was right up there, right at the top of, of his, his game. <laughs> Go yeah. on, wrap it up. And was recognised nationally. Oh, Where's your hands? Here. Yeah. Both you? <laughs> Everything was was starting to look good. The girls were developing well and Rach was happy with doing what she was doing. I'd left my job, my head chef job at, at Ricky's to start up my own catering business in Noosa. We had all the family over for Christmas in, in 2011. We all had fun and he, I remember him picking up some of the kids and throwing them in the pool. And Rachel and I were jumping on the trampoline together and. We had a lovely day. I just decided I'm going to give Rachel the biggest love bomb this Christmas just to show her how much I love her. And it had all these handmade love heart shaped cushions. And she was just started crying when I gave it to her. And she said to me, aren't we so lucky that we have this and we're as, so close to each other as sisters can stand? And I said, what? And she said, this love that we have. And we're both, her tears running down our face. But I'm so thankful for that moment. It was a, it was a lovely day and, uh, and you just don't expect that in 24 hours or 18 hours that the whole, whole world is sort of going to collapse. Everyone went home and then Rachel went up onto the veranda and stood with the girls and I slowly reversed out, waved to them left them standing there on that veranda and that's the, the last picture I have of my family. And they all went home and we went to bed and then that was the last time I saw my family. So that was something that, you know, you, you just can't even imagine. Multiple calls were made to triple zero just after 3 a.m. after an explosion woke neighbours. As we approached the scene, it was 
very clear that the, the, the house was, was burning freely. Uh, people were yelling things at us, uh, telling that the family's still inside. There was a person lying on the ground on the right-hand side of the driveway. We weren't sure how he was going to survive what he's been through. The neighbours said that Matt tried valiantly to open doors to get access to the building to get his children, but the flames and the, and the debris that was as a result of the fire forced him back. It was Boxing Day morning and we woke up and heard on the news that there'd been a house fire at Tewantin and um, a woman and three children had died. I did try ringing Matt's number and Rachel's number and all I got was an uh, answering machine. Plainclothes detectives came at around 10am in the morning and they told us that there'd been a fire and Rachel and the girls didn't make it and that Matt had critical burns. Celebrity chef Matt Galinsky is fighting for his life after trying in vain to rescue his wife and three daughters from a horrifying house fire. There's certainly flashbacks of the last few minutes that do come back to me all the time. I can't put that into a cohesive, you know, sequence. So, you know, that's... I, I don't remember very much of that at all, to be honest. We think that it was either the Christmas lights or the transformer or the board that they were plugged into, so it was quite likely electrical. We knew for sure that in Matt's case that he had working alarms in the house, but they simply didn't work. You just go into shock. I sort of knew the steps that I had to take and the main thing was that, you know, Matt is still alive and first we've got to take care of him. Went down to Brisbane and he was in an induced coma. Uh, I remember going into the room he was in and looking at him and then passing out on the floor of his room in ICU. And he was barely recognisable to me. He had a major burn, you know, 40 to 50% of his body surface area was burned. The extent of his burns required several surgeries and I think that would have got into surgeries in the teens. So it's an ongoing process. We had him knocked out for two months. and We don't want them to know what we're doing to them, what they're going through. When they sort of gave me the word that they were going to uh, wake him up, I just had to tell him. And um, there's no other way of, of... There's no easy way of doing it. I remember the first thing I said was, oh, I couldn't speak, I actually had to use a board. But I said, can you get me a mobile phone so I can call Rachel? And he had to straight out just tell me, sorry, mate, they're, they're all gone. I'm not a suicide sort of person, but I just sort of went, God, really? You spent eight weeks keeping me alive? Why would you bother? Why, what makes you think that I want to be alive still? He just took it very calmly and, and um, had, to, had to process it in his own time then. They were still doing operations on me, so skin grafting, and that's extremely painful. I'd be burning up at night and desperately trying to tell the nurse that I needed ice packs on my stomach and they couldn't understand me. But it was the emotional pain that was the hardest thing to actually deal with at that time. I always felt that it was necessary for Matt to make his de decisions with, with the funerals. And so I kept putting it off until we were able to communicate. We had the alphabet chart there. I put it up and he went, F, U, N. And I thought, fun, what's... But then he went E-R-A-L-S. And, and I said, oh, do you want to talk about funerals, mate? And he said, yes. Friends and family gathered on the Sunshine Coast today to farewell the family of celebrity chef Matt Golinski. I tried to do the things that I knew Rach and Matt would have wanted done. 
girl's grandfather, Keith Galinsky, played a Tibetan gong at today's service to symbolise peace and healing. Rach and the girls love that gong. I didn't even get to go to my girl's funeral, you know, that's it. and he had to deal with all that himself. All my family and all my friends were just incredible with the, with the way they pulled together for me. My sister and my dad were bringing sack loads of cards and letters from people all over Australia. And some of them were had money in them, some of them were people that had held events at their house to raise money for me. And I was like, really? That's the point where I changed. I went, oh, wow, this is people really want, want to see me survive this and get through it, so I better bloody well do it. Matt was determined to get better. We can only do so much, but he did most of the hard work to get himself um, back on the road to recovery. You could tell he was in pain, mentally in pain, but a person under stress um, displaying grace would, is probably a way of describing his time, uh, you know, very impressive. And I've seen a few burn patients these, you know, over my years. They released him when I remember picking him up from the hospital and, and then driving home. You are driving home, but he's got no home. We became a lot closer after that than before it. It's almost like him starting at the beginning again, but I had the opportunity to sort of find out a lot more about him as he grew the second time. Garden's not looking too great anymore, is it? <laughs> when I got out of hospital and I came back here to live with Dad and, and you know, I had plenty of time on my hands, um, I took the opportunity to, you know, turn this all into a, into a veggie garden and, um, and had Dad here to, you know, to teach me, basically, to, to show me what to do. We hadn't really spent any really great quality time, got to know each other that well until that point. Yeah. We seem to get each other's uh, wry sense of humour. Mm. <laughs> he was always keeping an eye on me emotionally, and it's like he was perched ready for something bad for me to sort of fall apart. I was worried about when he was on his own for extended periods of time, what, what would happen, what would go through his mind. It took some stupid heavy drinking and all that sort of stupid stuff that you do where you just want to destroy yourself. Oh, he probably comes across to some people as being unemotional, but I think probably the exact opposite is true. He's extremely emotional, um, but he's also extremely private. So I think he still does have a lot to process. The canoe's one of the things that survived the fire, so it's, um, it's one of those possessions, I suppose, that's pretty special. Um, it's, some, it's something that me and the girls used to share, go out fishing um, in it, so it's nice, to, it's nice that I've still got it. It's a roller coaster of emotions sometimes. You can have triggers that trigger you off. You'll be down the river and you'll be, you walk past the spot where you used to sit and have ice creams or fish and chips or whatever, and, and it can be like a, a real kick, you know? But to me, there's already so many people that have been, that have been saddened by this whole trauma, this whole situation that's happened. And it's like, if, you know, I can't, I can't make them any more sadder. It wouldn't be fair. When he first visited me, I said, look, I'd really like you to know that I'd really love you to meet someone and, and that you're young enough to, to meet someone and get married again and have children. I just felt he needed to know that, you know. I think after knowing how distraught he would have felt inside losing his Precious Girls and Rachel, um, I think he needed to have as much comfort as he could get. It just so happened that there was a rehab hospital 
three minutes from my dad's place. So I was able to just go there every day. Ouch. Try and keep that other knee down. I was very nervous with him coming in because it touched everyone's heart, what happened. <laughs> Bit tight. But with everything bad that had happened to him, he was, yeah, never tries to make people feel sorry for him or anything like that. <laughs> We found out that our parents live across the road from each other. We had lots of common interests, so I started just to be really nice. I'd invite him and friends from work to see the bands play and just tried to get him out to get back to normal a bit. We just ended up hanging out a lot. We'd go for jogs together. I never thought, oh, I'm ready for another relationship now. It wasn't something that I was looking for at all. It really crossed my mind. So now turn it to uppers. But I could see with her this sort of genuine compassion for all these people that were in a really vulnerable situation. Go a little bit higher again. Stretch I did see it as a friendship. And I'm sure Matt did for, at the beginning as well. And maybe, I don't know, if I let him on a little. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't mean to. For me, I was kind of like, oh, I quite like this girl. She's, you know, she's quite nice and, and she's single. I don't, I don't understand what's wrong with her. <laughs> it's like, and, and eventually I sort of went, oh, you know, I better, I better snap her up before somebody else realises what a good catch she is. I kept attracting all these wrong guys and there was a really nice one right in front of me. And then I rang her up one day and sort of went, wouldn't mind if we, you know, what do you think about going out with me? I didn't know what to say and pretty much hung up on him. And <laughs> oops. And then I got all upset. I was at mum and dad's place and I was in front of mum and went, we were just meant to be friends and yeah. But then deep down, I guess I did have feelings for him. He's just a beautiful person. Like, I don't know, we get on so well together. I always knew that I was bringing a lot of baggage into a, a new relationship. She's coming into my situation, which is awful. I'm sure Rachel and the girls were at the top of Matt's mind all the time as well. But I also know that Rachel would want Matt to be happy. You do have that feeling of, I wouldn't be able to replace Rachel. So to start with, I probably had little issues every now and then, but Matt and I talk about a lot of things and very open, and he'll talk about his girls. Um, I don't like to pry, but I'm always there to listen. Rachel, she would have chosen someone exactly like Erin. I think she'd be extremely happy. A lot of people even think that possibly she had something to do with choosing Aaron. You look back on things and wonder how they happen, you know, and, and why they happen. She obviously was great for him in his recovery and I suppose you hear of uh, people becoming attached to their carers, but he'd lost so much love from his life that he needed to get some love back in his life. It became clear that cooking would be a part of the, the building blocks to, 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 to helping him mend. Kimpy Council came to me and said, will you be our food ambassador? Which involves me being an advocate for the producers in the region. Getting to know them, going to their farms, understanding what they do, and then being the person that can go out there and, and spruik that to the public. These ones here we go heading off Thursday. Oh, will they? Yeah. He wanted to shine the light on, on his own backyard. And it's it's c continues to be how he cooks today. I mean, probably no one no one would understand his region from a culinary point, a gastronomic point of view, any better than him. two main courses, so the pork belly um, came from Piggy in the middle. Um, is that oil too hot? 
It's amazing when you go to these places. I gain a lot from doing it because I get to meet all these great people. I learn more about the actual product, how it's grown, how it's produced, um, and then it makes me a better chef. Matt proposed to me at the top of Mount Karura, not far from where we live. It's our favourite spot. I didn't have any idea that he was going to, and I was a little bit in shock. And he said if I said no, that he'd push me off the mountain. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows how much I loved being a dad. So when that was taken away from me, it was, um, you know, quite possibly the cruelest thing that anybody could do. I reached a point, it took me a while, but I reached a point where, with Erin where it was like, well, of course I want to have kids, you know, I'd have a hundred of them if I could. After trying for quite a while, nothing was happening. Went and both got checked and it came back to me that, oh, sorry, mate, you've got zero sperm count. I guess from all of Matt's um, operations in the past, things weren't looking very good on his front. So I went to a guy in Brisbane who said, there's one last thing we could try. I can go in with a microscope and see if I can find anything in there at all. The surgeon found 14 for, of, yeah. And even the surgeon was pretty emotional about that. Um, so then we had a chance to try IVF. And we were successful the first go, <laughs> which is, yeah. And Aluna's pretty special. <laughs> yeah, she's a very special little one. <laughs> so, and she's got Matt's dimples. <laughs> It's just besotted, <laughs> of course, of course he is, you know, she, she's just his special little, little girl now. The stars all aligned, she was meant to be here and she's obviously happy to be here and she just lights up my world, you know. <laughs> Aluna coming along has basically cemented his will to live, I guess, his motivation to be here and to be a father and to be present in her life. She's blessed to all of us, I think. Should we try some? What do you reckon? If I hadn't have been able to cook again, it probably would have destroyed me. If that doctor had come into the room and said, no, sorry, I don't think, you know, you'd, I couldn't find anything. Yum. Got this one? I don't know how I would have reacted to that. I don't think, uh, I don't know how, whether I could have taken that, but she's here, it's happened and she's amazing. I'm so happy for Matt that he's found someone that is also the love of his life. Having this, this sort of second go at life and the way everything sort of worked out and then little Aluna coming along. I think uh, it has been a miracle, really. She's nine months old now and so the pressure's on uh, from me to Erin. Let's, um, let's go again as soon as we possibly can. There's two in the bank. So, yeah, we've got, you know, the possibility of, of three all up. You never know, you know, the other two embryos may not, may not work, but, yeah, I'm going to give it a damn red-hot go. Mm -hmm.